the last talk of the day. I won't keep you uh, from dinner too long. Uh, hope you had a good day and good uh, kernel recipe so far. My name is Chris Down. Uh, I work as an engineer at Meta. Uh, kind of uh, my job is half working on distributed systems problems and half of it is working on kernel problems. Um, I'm also one of the maintainers of the SystemD project, so you can think of some good heckles for me, uh, for me later. Uh, my work is mostly in the area of things around site reliability, uh, resource control, C groups, error detection, that kind of stuff. So effective resource control requires piecing together and improving many kind of old, new, and bespoke kernel and user space features. And my hope is by the end of the talk, uh, we'll hopefully understand some more about the challenges which we're having serving one of the largest fleets in the world at Meta. Um, and for those on kernel side, maybe we can brainstorm a bit more um, on things we can do to improve the state of resource control overall. And for those in a service reliability facing role, maybe it might give you some ideas for things that you can do for your services, because I know we have some kind of SRE adjacent people here. So at, at Meta and in terms of machines, uh, we just can't afford to waste capacity on any of them, because even a little bit of wastage on one machine means a huge amount of wastage fleet-wide. Ultimately, the goal is to use resources more efficiently fleet-wide in order to uh, make things more efficient and build the kernel infrastructure in order to do that. Another challenge that we have is that many huge side incidents are caused by lacking resource control. Not being able to, able to readily control things like CPU, I.O. and memory has caused some of the most pervasive issues that we've ever had as large companies. And resource control issues are something that we need to build an industry-wide initiative to solve. The elephant in the room over the last kind of three years, of course, is COVID. Uh, changes in behavior due to COVID in dramatically increased the usage of Facebook as a platform, and this was by about 27% or so of what we would usually expect. And this also came, uh, annoyingly, at a time where you could now not buy anything in order to help you with that, right? We had global shortages in memory, we had global shortages on CPUs, disks, um, and in general, we needed to make better use of hardware across the fleet, right? So that led to a fairly significant acceleration of existing initiatives that we had to build the kernel infrastructure and build the user space infrastructure to, to help there. Almost every single time that I give this, or like a talk like this in public, uh, what happens is somebody goes on Hacker News and goes, why don't you just buy some more memory? Uh, now, I hate to tell you this, but when you have several million servers, it's actually not very easy to do that, right? Um, there's a huge amount of cost involved there, but that's not only cost in terms of money, which is indeed significant, and I'm glad it doesn't come out of my bank account, um, but also in things like power draw, thermals, uh, hardware design trade-offs, right? So, not to mention during COVID, we just cannot get that hardware in the first place. So, how does all this capacity and uh, reliability stuff relate to C-groups, right? So, I'm sure many of you are familiar and have seen kind of patches flying upstream for them over the last, like, 14 years, right? C-groups are this kernel mechanism to balance things that you share across a machine, like CPU, memory, I.O. Um, every single modern contain resource control user and containerization engine uses them because they solve a huge amount of problems that we've had with kind of classic resource control, like U-limits and the like. Uh, C-Groups have existed for about 14 years now, and most notably seven years ago, we released the stable version of C-Group V2 in kernel 4.5. And I gave a whole talk at the time about why we were doing what we were doing, and I guess that's kind of a good historical kind of like time capsule of where we were at the point. But things have advanced quite a lot since then. Uh, while I'm sure that some of you are familiar with C-Groups a bit, um, it's pretty important that we make sure that we're familiar with the same things and we're on the same page about things. Otherwise, things are going to get extraordinarily confusing later when I explain why we are doing what we are doing. Um, especially, it's very important to understand why we had to so fundamentally redesign C-Groups, why we had to make a V2 instead of making incremental improvements to the old model. Um, the first change that we made really was in how we organize the C groups themselves. And this is more than just an aesthetic change um, because it allows us to do things that we've never been able to do before from a technical perspective. And fundamentally, those technical reasons, which I'll go over, are, are the reasons why we've had to make this entirely new version. If you've had some interaction with C groups in the past, it's entirely possible and even likely that you may be, well, using it right now. Version 2 has existed since 2016. We've been working on it Far, below, far before that, but most distributions historically were worried about things like, for example, Docker doesn't support it. And that's a problem because then people try and run Docker on your distribution and they, the Docker crashes or Docker just doesn't work, right? Now, though, pretty much all of these things do, like Docker, Alexi, all those kind of things support it just fine. 
And Fedora even moved to Security 2 by default quite a few years ago. And this was kind of a nice poke to you know, get everyone's arse in gear when Docker doesn't work on your distribution anymore. So uh, that was pretty helpful. So in V1, SysFS cgroup contains controller names as directories at the top level. So that's things like CPU, memory, and so on and so forth. Inside those directories, you have a hierarchy for each resource. So for example, in CPU, you would have files for you know, CPU management and CPU uh, sharing. Uh, if you don't know if you're on V1 or V2, if you see like cgroup memory, stuff like that at the base, then that's pretty much a dead guarantee that you're on the legacy one. So the cgroup file system is typically mounted at sysfs cgroup. Inside, you have this directory of resources. And each resource, importantly, maintains its own distinct hierarchy, right? You can have a single PID in group A in one resource and have it in group B in other resources. Uh, and this flexibility has pretty negative technical implications, um, which I'll come back to in a moment. The fundamental paradigm of secret v1, which we wanted to change, is that secrets only exist in the context of a single resource. There's only one uh, only one PID, but only per resource, right? So in, secret, in CPU, you might have a PID in a particular secret. In memory, you have it in a different secret. And it's totally possible that that can cause uh, quite a few problems. By contrast, in secret v2, what we see is that we don't see the resource directories at all, right? We see the directories for these systemd units themselves. But how do we now know which resource these cgroups apply to? Well, the way that this whole thing works is completely inverted, right? Now cgroups are not created for a particular resource, but instead resources get enabled or disabled as part of this kind of unified hierarchy which controls all resources. This means that, for example, you explicitly opt into having the CPU controller enabled or whatever controller in some part of the subtree, and when you enable it, we give you some files to control that. So why wasn't what we had in secret v1 enough? Well, let's look a little bit about how secret v2 uh, is designed and illustrate some of the cases it solves. In secret v2, we have this unified hierarchy. So a PID is in one and exactly one C group on the entire machine. Uh, it cannot be in different ones for memory or CPU. Um, and instead of having a C group per resource, we now have these resources enabled or disabled per C group. So the way it works is you or your container or init system opt into subset, some subset of controllers using the C group uh, subtree control file. You write plus memory or plus CPU, and voila, you get controllers for that. Uh, you get the files to control it inside that C group. This might seem like a purely aesthetic change, but this has quite significant technical advantages compared to the previous strategy. Uh, for example, without this major API change, we simply cannot use cgroups in order to do complex resource control at scale. Take the following scenario. Memory starts to run out on your machine. Uh, so when we start running out of memory, we need to inevitably try and free some up, right? And if we're particularly memory bound and it's hard to free pages, we're going to then start doing some disk I.O. And Looking through available memory to find pages which can be freed could be really, really expensive if the machine is already loaded or it's particularly hard to find pages right now because the system is highly contended. So it's entirely possible this whole thing is going to cross non-trivial CPU cycles to do. So without having this unified or single resource hierarchy, we actually can't manage this situation very well whatsoever, right? Um, in V1, we cannot stop a CPU from just taking all of the disk I.O. on the machine when it's becoming highly compressed on memory. So without this API change, effective resource control becomes extremely difficult to manage. And that's why we've had to kind of reinvent a little bit how some parts of Linux resource management and some parts of C groups work in order to make things scale. Um, so if we look at what it means to kind of reinvent from the ground up in the case of memory, of course, in Linux, we have many different types of memory, right? We have, uh, from the CPU's perspective, they are all fairly similar, but Linux t treats like anonymous memory, caches, buffers, and so on and so forth as being quite semantically different. Um, the problem is, if you ask most system administrators, what, uh, what, what do you think about page caches or buffers and this kind of stuff? They'll say it's reclaimable. And this is an example of being technically correct, but completely useless, right? Like uh, being reclaimable doesn't mean it's reclaimable right now. Uh, the problem is they, they have this understanding that those things can be freed with no cost. Um, for example, if some application is hammering on some file, it's very, very unlikely that we're going to choose to drop it from cache, right? So. While under some circumstances, yes, they can be trivially freed, um, it's not necessarily the case. And this results in an inevitable huge amount of people posting in the resource control group, at least of our company, posting, why did my application oom when I have, quote unquote, free memory, right? Because it's not free, because you actually need it. One of the other technically correct but misleading metrics we have 
um, is is RSS, right? Um, the, fact is, the fact that caches can be essential is an example of why RSS, which is a metric that people love to measure on dashboards and in alarms and everything, is really kind of bullshit for what they want to use it for. It, because it often skews a huge amount of attention towards a very few and select types of memory, right? It skews a lot of, me uh, a, a lot of attention towards anonymous memory and MAP files and some other things. But we forget that many workloads simply cannot operate without extensive uh, bu buffers and caches, right? For example, in one egregious case, we have a daemon at Meta, and this daemon aggregates metrics across a machine, and then it sends those metrics to centralized storage. Uh, and as part of this process, what it does is runs a bunch of scripts that a bunch of teams have written over the years in order to go and get those metrics and decide what to collect, right? For years, the team which had maintained this daemon thought that, based on RSS, their memory usage across the fleet on every single machine was 100 to 150 megabytes. Uh, using Secret V2 and some of the other technologies which we have in this talk, uh, it was demonstrated it's closer to about two gigabytes of usage across the fleet, which when you have several million servers is a lot of memory to not realize that you are missing. And almost all of that memory is locked away in caches, which people mistakenly believe are only optional for forward progress. So we measure RSS because it's easy to measure. It's relatively static, right? Not because it's necessarily a very good measurement. Um, so when somebody asks how much memory your application uses, it's kind of hard to answer unless you've actually compressed the working set down to a reasonable size, which we'll go over how you can do. So this is why in Secret 2 we limit and account for all types of memory together. We have this memory.max file, which limits not only based on RSS, but really everything, uh, even things like slabs that have slab account set. And this is a step change from the old days of these per process limits in Secret 1, which only limit kind of a, a subset of memory types. So on the surface, it looks like this should work reasonably well. And it does. It does exactly what it says on the tin, but it's exactly the same problem we had with RSS, right? It's does exactly what it says, but it's not necessarily what you wanted. And the problem here is how should you even use this to compose a reliable system? So uh, let's say that you have a couple of slices in system D terminology, uh, a couple of different kind of groupings of application. So best effort applications are things like you know, configuration management or metric collection, things that you would really like to have running pretty regularly on your machine. But if the machine is really heavily under pressure, then we can live without them for a bit. For example, uh, you know, Chef or, or, doc, uh, or Puppet or whatever. The workload, on the other hand, consists of the thing which you actually want to run on the machine. For example, it might be HHVM on a web server or MySQL on a database server. Um, you could, of course, also have multiple workloads on a machine at the same time, but for now, I mean, we'll go over that in a second, but for now, let's stick with one for simplicity. Um, the point is, if this thing is not running, the whole point of the machine is moot. So the typical system administrator, being responsible, might have a way of thinking that goes something like this. You are terrified that non-critical applications may cause problems for your workload. So you put it in best effort slice, and then you set a memory.max on it. Oh, but now you have some particularly badly behaved application in best effort slice, and you want to set a memory tighter memory.max for that in particular. Oh, and now you're also worried that your main application is going to cause a global is going to cause global memory contention, and is going to cause a global oom. So you also set a memory dot max on that as well, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, until you have a system which you cannot reason about whatsoever anymore. Because inevitably, what's going to happen is one of these is legitimately going to grow a little bit, and then you're going to have no idea how to adjust any of these settings whatsoever because you don't know why it is the value it is, and you don't really know what, what is the intended goal of the system. This is infinitely worse if you work somewhere like Facebook, Google, those kind of places, because you have a thousand service owners who may or may, know, may, or may not know what they are doing, setting these limits everywhere on the system, and you have no idea what to do about it. So our ultimate goal here was really just to run the thing in workload.slice, right? So why don't we just write something like, like this? So memory.low is a fundamental change of the way that we've gone about controlling memory on Unix for the past 50 years. So the idea is that instead of trying to control memory by putting applications into this kind of tight coffin, we should just say, you know, how much, how much do the applications in the secret put that we're trying to prioritize actually need to do their job? Um, importantly, this doesn't reserve memory from the system. It's not like 
uh, the way that huge pages, for example, used to work. It doesn't take the memory away from the system. Uh, this all just works based on reclaim biasing. So if you're under the memory lo low threshold, we don't reclaim from you typically. The only exception being if there's global memory pressure, then we might decide to do something about that. Um, we also have another type of protection called memory.min, which doesn't do anything if there's global uh, memory pressure. It, it prefers to oom instead of reclaim. Um, but in general, the way it works is we use memory.low for workloads on the machine, and we use memory.min for critical host services like things like uh, Debus daemon and stuff like that. We talked a little bit earlier about why RSS, while indeed measuring what it claims to measure, can be a very highly misleading metric. And I, I think this is an important thing to think about as kernel developers as we kind of develop APIs that users are inevitably going to misunderstand. Um, but in SigRV2, we have this file called memory.current that measures the current memory usage, including everything like slabs, well, slabs with slab account, caches, buffers. So job done, right? Well, one of the more common things that happens when inevitably I go to a conference and you say, you know, don't use RSS because it's a shit metric, is that people set up a monitor based on memory.current. And memory.current is the file that, as you might guess, actually, you know, tells the truth. It actually gives the current memory usage. But it's quite important to understand why that mean, what that means and why we haven't gravitated towards this as a metric previously. So the very fact that we're not talking about RSS anymore, but we're instead talking about all types of memory, means that the ramifications are very different. Um, so all of, having all of these different types of memory which can grow kind of on an altruistic basis where the system is doing it just because there's no pressure uh, means that uh, things can get quite complicated. So for example, the reason people chose RSS to limit on, again, wasn't really because it's useful, it's because it's relatively static. It doesn't move around a lot, it's easy enough to set a limit on it, and if you're a system administrator, it makes you feel good at night, right? Like, it makes you feel like you did something, even if you never really verified that it actually works. Memory.current, on the other hand, suffers from exactly the opposite problem, which is it tells the truth, and people have absolutely no idea how to handle the truth. Um, for example, if you set an eight gigabyte memory limit, and then you let your system run for a while, what's memory.current gonna be? It's gonna be eight gigabytes, because of course we filled it up with nice caches, we filled it up with nice buffers, we filled it with all kinds of nice things. It's not that your application really needs eight gigabytes, right? It's not that it really needs that amount of memory, it's just that you've set the limit and will grow up to that. If there was no global pressure to not do so, then why not? So what should we do? How should we then know what the actual amount of memory needed for any application is given at a given time? So to answer this question, we need the assistance of another technology we created a matter, which is PSI. So one problem that end users have is being able to tell that they are out of physical memory before it happens. Uh, if you ask a system administrator if a machine is oversubscribed on memory, like I think the vast majority of them are going to open the same things we used like 30, 40 years ago, like PS or Top, or some modern equivalent, like some modern colorful analog to those tools, right? Um, but the problem with looking at free memory, especially the ones which are exposed by those kind of tools, is it doesn't really tell us how much memory could be reclaimed if it's really required. That is, having your memory fully in use doesn't typically imply being saturated, right? The same is true even for the more correct but also incorrect metric of things like mem available in proc mem info, which I think some of us have come to regret ever creating. Um, another metric that some people bring up are things like page scans, but it is really hard to tell, for example, with page scans, what is an efficient use of the system on a memory bound workload from you're about to go over the edge, right? That's pretty difficult. So it's not really easy to tell just from these kind of metrics alone whether the system is about to go over the cliff. Uh, there are also other metrics, of course, but all of them uh, have their caveats and limitations, and they can all typically trigger under some kind of normal operation uh, just as much as they could trigger under some system instability or oversaturation. So our goal here is to create an approximation of what we are terming memory pressure. So what is memory pressure? Well, we've never really had a metric like this in the kernel before. We have all those related metrics which I've just gone over. Um, but even with all those metrics, it, it is hard to tell real pressure from system oversaturation. Uh, so PSI uses metrics which are specific to a resource, in this case memory, in order to determine whether it's oversubscribed. For example, in memory, we use the amount of time that threads on the system were stuck, they were stalled doing memory work, which we perceive we wouldn't have had to do if more memory was available. So in this case, some means that some threads in that C group were stuck on memory work for, say, 0.21% of the time in the last 10 seconds. And full means the same, just that all threads were stuck. Um, this could be things like 
waiting for a kernel memory lock. It could be being throttled. It could be waiting for reclaim to finish. But even more than that, it comes back to the kind of stuff we talked about earlier, right? It could be memory-related I.O., which can really dominate, like refaulting file content into the page cache or swapping in. Um, so pressure is essentially saying, if I had more memory, I could run, say, 0.21% faster. Uh, these can also be really useful as part of developing high reliability and high availability applications. So, for example, we use this in order to determine in advance whether we are about to use too much memory on things like our async job tier um, and do load shedding or backing off new requests. And we also use it for our user space pre-UM detector, which is UMD, um, which has a kind of fine-grained policy engine about when to invoke a, a user space UM killer. Um, we also use it for all sorts of other things, not just cross-meta. Android is also using it for some resource contention stuff. Um, and importantly, you can't just get this by like measuring RSS, right? Like this is kind of a different paradigm altogether. So how does this all relate to the case which we mentioned in the slide before that about having some slack in memory.current where we've now got these nice caches and buffers and stuff like that? So let's take an example kernel build where with no limits, we have a peak memory.current, we have a peak memory usage of just over 800 megabytes. In C group v2, we have this tunable called memory.high, and this tunable reclaims memory from a C group until it goes back under the threshold set, or it will throttle you. So right now, things take about four minutes with no limits. However, when we apply a memory threshold of 600 megabytes, actually the job finishes in about the same amount of time, with 25% less available memory. It's still four minutes, just a second or more, so in all time. The same even happens when you go down to 400 megabytes. Now we're using half the memory which we have originally used with only a full, few seconds more wall time, usually a pretty good trade-off. However, if we dial it down just a little further, like 100 megabytes further, things will never even complete, right? This is nine minutes in and it's not done, so we have to control C it. So we know that the process needs about 300 to 400 megabytes of memory to operate with reasonable performance. But finding the exact cutoff where performance begins to plummet is a very tedious and error-prone process, right? Um, and this, this error-prone process also only works when the job does a fixed and highly repeatable amount of work every time it runs, like this example. So to get an accurate number for services at scale, like a web server where things may shrink or expand depending on load, we need a totally different way to go about that. So determining the exact amount of memory used by an application or the working set size is a very difficult and error prone task. And Senpai is a simple and self-contained tool that uses SecretB2's new pressure stall information system to determine how much memory your application actually needs. So it uses PSI and memory high to apply just enough memory pressure on a C group to evict cold memory pages that, are, that aren't necessary for nominal workload performance. It's essentially an integral controller which dynamically adapts to memory load peaks and troughs, like the case we were talking about before on a web server where when more requests come, we expand the limit, and when fewer come, we shrink it down again. So it can be used to answer this question of how much, does, how much memory does my application actually need at any given time? And in this case, we can find out the example for this compile job, which we were having a hard time with, is actually about 340 megabytes or so. To get there, the way it works is that we keep pushing on memory high until we start to see pressure, and then we adjust it back as necessary to keep it just tight enough without invoking an anemic power in the tasks. So what are the benefits of this shrinking? Why don't we just use kswapd, right? So as I mentioned, we had a team which for years believed their memory footprint was about 100 to 150 megabytes. And the way we eventually found out it was more like two gigabytes was by using Senpai in order to shrink their working set down to the size which it actually can operate at. And that's how we found out that it was actually about 10 times what they thought. Another thing that we use Senpai for is to get ahead of memory shortages and amortize the work ahead of time. Uh, when a machine is already heavily contended, it can be pretty hard to free memory quickly because resources are likely already to be highly uh, scarce. Uh, K-swap deboosting and threshold tuning is all well and good, um, but it doesn't always help here, right? Because it can still end up kicking in when we're about to go over the edge, when we don't necessarily have the cycles to do page scanning or whatever. So Senpai can help avoid these situations in the first place by proactively doing this work when the system is in a nominal state. So the combination of these things means that Senpai is an essential part of how we do stacking and measurement of meta. Uh, it not only gives us this accurate read on what the workload needs are right now, but it allows us to work out, you know, what are the needs going to be over time and adjust stacking as necessary. This also feeds into another of our efforts around efficiency, which is improving memory offloading. Traditionally, on most operating systems, you have exactly one memory offloading location, which is your disk. Um, 
even if you don't have swap, that's still true because, of course, you have things like demand paging and the page cache. Uh, so there are actually a lot of intermediate kind of granular areas we might want to use in order to provide some, some nice balance between these two extremes, right? Um, so when we're talking about offloading, that means that, yes, we are going to eventually have to page fold back into main memory, but getting that data back into main memory is, of course, for some things, much easier or much more difficult than others. For example, it's going to be much easier to page fold in from an SSD, of course, than it is from a hard disk. I think this is a paradigm we all know, uh, not only because it's slow, but because it tends to involve random reads. But there are more granular things we can do as well, rather than just thinking about SSDs or hard disks. For example, one of the things we can start to do is start looking at strategies outside of the hardware. One of the problems with the duality of either being in RAM or being on the disk is that uh, even SSDs, of course, tend to be several orders of magnitude slower than main memory. Um, but many workloads have what we would probably term warm memory, pages which are accessed relatively frequently, uh, but they are not constantly needed to make forward progress. So one area which we've been heavily invested in is improving and productionizing ZSwap, which transparently compresses these kind of warm but not hot pages. Um, so it compresses pages which look like they will compress well uh, and are not too hot into this separate pool in main memory. In order to use those pages, they do have to then be page folded back into main memory, of course. Um, but this is usually pretty cheap and fast, certainly a lot cheaper and faster than it would be from a disk. One problem that we had when we set this up was that even when we configured the kernel then to swap as aggressively as possible with this new setup, it still wouldn't do it unless it was right, very close to saturation. Um, if you've looked at the swap code, and I'm sure that man has, uh, if, if, you've looked at the, if you've looked at the swap code or the paging code, uh, then, uh, I mean, I think you know some of why this may have been in the past, because we have spinning disks, right? Like spinning disks plus swap equals bad time. Uh, that was pretty much the equation by which we ran the paging code for uh, the vast majority of the, the kernel's history. Um, the old logic has quite a few kind of abstruse heuristics with that in mind, and most of them aren't really ideal for the current state of swap, right? Um, so we tried to think about how we can make this more efficient for the modern era. Um, we have non-rotational disks, we have Zswap, we have SSDs, we have things like uh, Compute Express Link coming into the pipeline, um, and you're, uh, we want to kind of make the use of these mediums more efficient for the modern era. And for this reason, even with swappiness set to 100, like we weren't managing to get like any kind of any kind of paging really happening. Um, so in recent kernels, we've reworked how the reclaim algorithm works in order to try and be more willing to do it if safe. If safe. The new algorithm works like this. First, we now have code to track all swap-ins and cache misses across the system. So for every cache page, which we are having to f page fault and evict, and page fault and evict, and page fault and evict, and I'm sorry for that big link, uh, try swapping you know, a cold heap page instead, or at least what we believe to be a cold heap page. If we are unlucky, and this heap page then gets paged right back in, that's no biggie. Next, next time we'll try and get a different one. However, if we are lucky, uh, and we are actually going to manage to do it, then that's another page which we can use for caches and other processes. And this means that we can now engage swap a lot more readily in most scenarios. Importantly, though, we are not adding IO load. We are just being more intentional about how to, how to use it. Right? We only trade one type of paging for another type of paging. Um, our goal here is to reach the optimal state for disk I.O., where the optimal state would be the minimum amount of disk I.O. needed to sustain nominal workload performance. And ideally, we do that using this kind of tiered model of hot memory in uh, faulted in, uh, warm memory in Z-swap, and so on and so forth. This is a super simple idea compared to the heuristics of the old model, and uh, the old algorithm generally it's like somewhat complicated to reason about, um, but in general the point is that it wasn't really written for an era like Z-swap or SSD. So what were the effects of this strategy change in production? So on web servers, we not only noticed a significant increase in performance, but we also noticed a reduction in heap memory uh, by about 2 gigabytes or so, out of about 16 gigabytes total. The cache then grew in order to fill this newly freed space and grew by about 2 gigabytes, from about 2 gigabytes of cache to 4 gigabytes of cache. We also noticed a measurable increase in web server performance from this change, which was, of course, deeply encouraging. And these are all kind of indications that we are now increasingly making better forward progress, right? Um, so, of course, then the disk amount of disk I.O. is also reduced. Um, but it's not often you get this kind of benefit in performance, disk I.O. and memory usage instead of having to trade off between them. 
Um, this also meant that on some workloads, we now had opportunities to stack uh, multiple workloads on a single machine where we previously couldn't do that. Uh, many machines don't use up all of their resources, but they use up just enough uh, that it's hard to run a second workload there. For example, if you're right on the edge on memory usage. And this is another cool thing that we now potentially can do on tiers where we previously couldn't do that. The combination of, all of these changes, the swap algorithm using Zswap, and squeezing workloads was a huge part of our operation, especially during COVID, and we continue to use them to this day. Um, all of these things acting together, we term TMO, or transparent memory offload, and you can see some of the results we've had in production here. Um, in some cases, we were able to save up to 20% of critical fleet-wide workload memory with either neutral or, in ca some cases, positive effects on performance. Uh, and this also opens up, of course, huge opportunities for stacking on a single machine. This whole topic has a huge amount to cover. I could really do like a huge talk on this myself, but uh, Johannes Weiner and Dan Schatzberg uh, did a big post on why we're doing what we're doing and in more detail, uh, and that's available at the link at the bottom. So let's come back to this slide from earlier. Um, we briefly touched on the fact that if bounded, one resource can just turn into another resource, particularly egregious case being memory turning into IO. For this reason, we always need to have controls on I.O. when we have controls on memory. Otherwise, memory pressure is just going to turn into disk I.O. Probably the most jejune way to solve that is by trying to limit disk bandwidth or IOPS, which is kind of the traditionalist way to go about this, right? However, this usually doesn't manifest very well in reality. If you think about any modern storage device, they're a queued device, right? But that means that if you throw a shit ton of commands at it, guess what? You get a shit ton more performance, and you have no idea where it comes from, because God knows how these disks work. Um, the mixture of I.O. also really matters, like reads versus writes, sequential versus uh, random. Even on SSDs, to some extent, this, this somewhat matters. Um, it's actually really hard to determine a metric for loadedness for storage devices. If you look at a, a graph on most, like on most uh, monitoring systems, it tends to be, what is the percentage of time, of all time, which we are spent doing a, I.O. work, but that doesn't really work for a queued device, right? And the cost of one I.O. operation or one block of data being written is extremely variable depending on the larger context of the request. It's also really punitive. Um, if nobody else is using the disk, do I really want to have this fixed limit which nobody can ever exceed? So it's not really good for this best effort work and it's not really good for efficiency. So the first way in which we try to approach this problem is by using latency as a metric for workload health. So what we might do is apply a maximal target latency for I.O. completions on the main workload. And if we exceed that, what we start doing is throttling other C groups with looser latency requirements back to their own configured thresholds. And this prevents an application from thrashing on memory so badly that it just kills I.O. across the entire system. This actually works pretty well for systems where there's only one workload. But if you look at a multi-workload case like this, uh, here there being two high-priority workloads which are stacked on a single machine, one with an I.O. dot latency of 10 milliseconds and the other 30 milliseconds, the problem is as soon as workload one gets into trouble, everyone else is going to be throttled to some unacceptably slow uh, I.O. rate. Uh, that's fine if the thing you're throttling is just best effort, but it doesn't work very well when you have two high-priority things running on the same machine, right? So IO.latency is great if you only have one workload, but it's hard to prioritize multiple stacked workloads. So how can we solve this? So our solution as of now is IO.cost, which might look very similar at first, um, but notice the emission of the units. These are not units in milliseconds, right? It's a kind of cost-based solution, more similar to how we do kind of task scheduling or something like that. So how do we know what 40 or 100 or 60 mean in this context? Well, the total of all three is 200. So in theory, if they're demanding it all at once, best effort should get about 20% of saturation capacity. Workload 1 should get about 50%, and workload 2 should get about 30%. Just like IO.latency, it's work conserving, which means that if nobody is using the disk whatsoever, any one of these can use the whole disk. Like, we don't punitively stop anybody from doing anything. But uh, as we mentioned, it's kind of hard to know when the disk is saturated in the first place, right? So how do we know when we reach 100% of saturation? So IO.cost internally builds a linear model of your disk. It sees how the disk responds to variable loads, and it builds a model of things like how expensive is read versus write IO? How expensive is sequential versus random IO? Um, what is the size of the IO and stuff like that? So it boils down this quite complex operation of uh, how much latency or throughput does my application need to a simple weight-based prioritization system. 
And it doesn't suffer from the same problem as IO latency because again, like if one gets throttled, you just go back to these configured uh, these configured values rather than punitively going back to you know 30 milliseconds or so. The basic on the fly model uses Q depth as a back off mechanism, which can work for some devices. Um, we also have, uh, for those who want more, want more fine grain control, this tool called ResCuddle Bench, which is a user space utility which can provide QoS tunables to the, the kernel. Um, it essentially injects load and benchmarks the effect on the disk. Um, this is a bit more accurate since we're very, we can easily uh, d we can easily inject very exact values and see what the performance is, but you can also use it passively. It will also build a model passively of your disk. Um, but whether you use the on-the-fly model or the QoS model, the weight system in general simplifies this operation of like, what am I going to do when the disk gets saturated quite a lot? Uh, in the old days, the historical response to Secret 2 when I went to places like Fostem or whatever was, that's nice, Docker doesn't support it, please get off the stage. Uh, Thankfully, things are things are a lot better now, uh, partially because of Fedora's efforts. But um, nowadays, we we have quite a diversity of container runtimes, and I'm quite quite happy to report it runs basically everywhere. So even if nothing changes from like the user space side, um, any user moving to Security 2 gets significantly more reliable accounting and significantly uh, more reliable like limiting. Um, so we spent quite a lot of time working with Docker and others to try and get work out how Security 2 should fit into their like OCI model and stuff like that. Uh, we're also really thankful to Fedora for making uh, Sigury 2 the default since Fedora 32, uh, as well as making things more reliable behind the scenes for users. Um, of course, it also got some people's arse into gear when, like you say, now Docker doesn't work on your distribution, could you please fix it? Uh, I think it was kind of a good signal that uh, if you're serious about containerization, you'd better start thinking about using Sigury 2 right now. The mysteriously blurry at the request of Meta Legal Team, Katie and Gnome folks, have also been busy using Cgroups to better manage their desktop handling. Uh, David H Edmondson and Henry Chain from KDE in particular recently gave a talk at KDE Academy, and the title was Using Cgroups to Make Things Amazing. Now, I won't name my talk that, but I'm more than happy if they want to name it that. Um, it basically goes over their use of Cgroups and especially Cgroup 2 for resource control and desktop interactive responsiveness. And this is definitely a kind of a developing space, um, but most of the major desktop environments are investing here. Um, and if you're interested in that, I definitely recommend giving the talk a watch. Uh, it really goes into the challenge they have and the unique features Cgroup 2 has to solve those. Android is also using the metrics supported by the PSI project to uh, detect and prevent memory pressure events. Um, of course, latency is absolutely critical on something like a phone, right? So it really suck if you're about to put something and when you click buy, every, uh, uh, everything froze because you went one page over. As such, we've been working with engineers from Google on uh, using these pressure metrics on Android uh, to more proactively prevent these scenarios. Hopefully this talk gave you some ideas about some things you might want to try out for yourself or maybe some things you'd like to discuss. Uh, we're still very actively improving and developing Secret V2 and feedback, uh, feedback from both user space and from kernel folks is one of the things we need to make it a long-term success. From the user space side, of course, everyone's needs are quite different and we're always quite eager to know what we could be doing to help with workloads and services from that perspective. Um, I'll be around after the talk if you want to chat, but also feel free to drop me an email or message elsewhere. I'm always happy to hear feedback or suggestions. I've been Chris Down, and this has been seven years of Secret V2, the future of Linux resource control. Thank you very much. Well, feel free to come. Oh, we we have somebody at the front. Is there anything, um, any work being done uh, with regards to swappiness? To you know, for the scenario where you have uh, the pyramid of higher, uh, um, alternatives to memory, let's say, uh, with Z swap and then SSDs and then hard drives, mm -hmm. to be able to say that. Um, this swap has this cost, this I.O. Yeah. cost versus this other I.O. cost for this other swap. Okay, I will, I, will, I, I kind of know how to answer, but I'm not sure how to answer it in a politically sensitive manner. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so I will not answer in a politically sensitive manner. Uh, you know how we have swap priorities. Let me tell you something about swap priorities. They don't work, and they've never worked. I think we invented them because somebody said we need swap priorities, and then we invented the most useless thing possible to satisfy that request, and then said we were done. 
Um, swappiness is kind of in the same state. We, we have the same problem with things like, um, uh, if you think about how we do like TCP tuning, for example. Like you have, okay, you can do some stuff on the socket, but some of the tunables are like this massive global tunable. No idea why it's global, but it certainly is global. And I don't know why it should apply to every single thing that you run on the machine. Swappiness has had exactly the same problem. Uh, we did have a, the exact opposite problem in secret group one, of course, which is you had like the swappiness tunable inside its cgroup, and inevitably what would happen is swappiness would get set by the init system after cgroups have already been set up, and then the swappiness is completely wrong on the system because the kernel and uh, the kernel is already set up based on the uh, the kernel configured default swappiness of 60, and then your init system doesn't change anything; it only changes the global one, which now does absolutely nothing. So, in answer to your question, I think we need to rethink how we go about, in general, just a small thing I'm asking, I think we need to think, rethink syscuddles in general. I think the syscuddle interface in general has, in some cases, been used to tune things which should never have been tuned at the global level, and perhaps one of those is uh, vm.swapiness. Perhaps that is one thing. For example, it's not only what device is slower or, or faster, right? But some workloads can tolerate more or less uh, anonymous swapping activity. Um, so the, tune, the kind of tuning there has not been great. So the answer is yes, I think we are thinking about it. I think we have a lot of things we want to fix first. But yes, it is something which is being thought about. <laughs> I, think I, can add to my, I think I can add to my resume. Talked about memory and Matthew Wilcox applauded. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, feel free to find me afterwards. I will be mysteriously lounging around outside. Thank you very much. Thank you.